Andy Agathangelo, the founder of the Transparency Task Force. The Transparency Task Force is a certified social enterprise. Uh, we started it in 2015. We started it because having joined the financial sector at the tender, naive, innocent age of 22, August the 18th, 1986 is when I joined the financial industry as a trainee financial advisor. And during the first 10 years of my career, I witnessed three bundles of corporate misconduct that I reported through the right channels. And on all three occasions, I ended up losing my job for doing the right thing. I know that some of you can relate to that big time. Throughout my time, I've known and met many brilliant financial advisors and financial planners, people I completely trust, completely like, get on very well with. At one point in my own career, I was the chairman of the Hanson Dorset LIA, the Life Insurance Association. I was involved with the management development group, and I really am genuinely, genuinely a fan of good people giving good financial advice. Um, I've often said it's on record that Having a good advisor is probably the single most important determination of success with your financial planning. Whether that's an advisor that's commission orientated or working for you on some special way, the way that, for example, Steve Connie does, is a matter of detail. But having the right kind of person on your side that is truly locked into your best interests is absolutely priceless. But as we know, that doesn't always happen. And even though the financial industry is regulated, there are still crooked people out there who will abuse the asymmetries in information and knowledge and experience to get one over you. And there are even really qualified people who on paper look like they're brilliant or do you over. If you don't believe me, talk to people like Sue Flood. This is a really important session, folks. We're going to be learning how some IFAs steal pensions with impunity. In other words, without the consequences that should come their way through having ripped people off and made their life a misery. Some of you will be aware of the book that we produced last year called Faces of Financial Crime, which is about the emotional and financial hardship and devastation that comes the way of people who have been ripped off. I'll be making reference to that later. Let's talk about Peter. I've known Peter for several years. He's been a very active member of the TTF community. A very, very experienced guy. I'm hoping that Peter will be happy to tell you what got him involved in the space in the first place. He may or may not be happy to do that. If you are happy to do so, Peter, I really would encourage it because I want people to understand what your life motivations have been and why you now do what you do and then i'm hoping peter you're going to help us understand how some crooked ifas quite literally um gain the system to their advantage at the expense of their clients again and again and again using um you know uh, flog it in Phoenix kind of approaches. I think Steve Conley used that phrase in an email I saw, saw earlier. It's a wonderful phrase, Steve. Please bring that phrase to life later on. So folks, please do pin back your ears, as they say. Uh, listen intently. Um, I vouch for Peter's credibility, authenticity, integrity. Um, he doesn't say it if he doesn't mean it, and he means what he says. And um, even though some of what Peter's going to say it might sound that can't possibly be true. Um, give the gentleman the benefit of the doubt and please put your hands together and welcome him to the mic. Peter, thank you very much indeed for taking the opportunity to share with us many, 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 many years of remarkably hard earned experience. Okay, um, well, which will be of great value to people. Peter, over to you. Thank you. Can you hear me? Perfectly well, sir. Yeah. Okay, that's good. So I'll go into uh, share. You're doing it. And Perfect. I'll do from the beginning. Yeah. And I'll do an introduction uh, before I crack on with the slides. 
That's all perfect, Billy. You can, sir. Okay. Well, I, my wife and I, with our children, immigrated to the UK in 1991 when the Australian economy imploded. Um, there was a lot of speculative property investments, and these were packaged and sold to other banks, which was banned after that, but it wasn't banned in the UK. So we, Australia was one of the countries that was not affected at all by the banking collapse in 2008. Uh, we lost everything in, in the collapse. Uh, there was only one bank or building society in Australia that didn't go bankrupt, which was the Commonwealth Bank, which is owned by the government. Uh, but every every building society and bank in Australia was technically bankrupt. Uh, so we came over here and uh, did it hard for a while and then uh, got on my feet and um, I did very had a very successful IT consultancy in the city. Uh, very successful, made a lot of money uh and then sold the business and two years after selling the business at the end of 99 uh i was introduced to uh, a bank manager uh and a number of other people lots of credibility who got me to invest a huge amount of money in uh, what was a ponzi scheme that stole 125 million pounds uh some of that my money our money uh that that didn't do us much good. We had a lovely big home in uh, St Albans, and we had to sell it and move to a uh, uh, an ex council house uh, terrace uh, in Kettering. Uh, and from at that point, when we lost all our money, uh, I started to try and and we, we were suing the bank. I started to understand, uh, try to understand how it came about, and that led me to to being. Uh, a partner and equal shareholder in what was a claims managing company, uh, which then morphed into a, a law firm six or seven years ago. And our law firm specializes in regulatory uh, crime uh, by financial advisors uh, who trick people into investing their pensions. Uh, so that, that's my, that's my background. So I'm, I'm, uh, I've done, I did really well, I did really badly, I did really well, uh, and I'm doing well now. So at, at 74 years of age, uh, I wouldn't want to do it again. Okay, introduction, how IFAs enable pension theft with impunity. Comparing the UK's approach to protecting clients from white collar crime perpetrated by regulated persons to say the USA, the difference is stark. The USA has state and federal law enforcement agencies totally separate from state and national financial organizations and government. When financial services wrongdoing is detected, there are multiple, multiple bodies that investigate and if unlawful activity is discovered, take action with the authority of, at a state and national level. The main crime compared with the UK white collar fraud is called wire uh, fraud. In layman's terms, Anyone trying to scam other people or groups through any form of communication, paradoxically even wireless, for example, phones, instant messaging, email, or through writing, signs, pictures, or sounds, uh, can be punished with a maximum prison sentence of 20 years. And that's a federal crime. It's always a felony. They will always go to prison. Uh, in the UK, financial dishonesty and deceit is only investigated when the crime is considered on a scale that the serious fraud office and or the City of London Police should get involved. Lying by an IFA as a fiduciary for financial gain by getting a client to transfer their pension investment into a high-risk, illiquid and unregulated scheme is not seen as fraud. It is termed as misadvising. The police consider it a civil matter and won't investigate. This is reinforced through the availability of the Ombudsman Service to arbitrate complaints and the FSCS to pay compensation. This presentation will describe how dishonesty, deceit and gaining money through deception by approved persons uses this pathway to obtain millions from vulnerable, vulnerable persons with very little chance that the perpetrators will be held accountable. Okay. Okay, the source of funds are pension holders, but they can be people with property that they can remortgage to release capital to invest with. That, that's what I did. 
but only four hundred thousand uh, pounds plus, and, and that accumulates into, for me, a million pounds. So you've got to have a pot of gold to go after. And then we have what I call the power people, HM Treasury. The Magistry Treasury is made up of, as we know, the revolving door uh, theory that uh, it it is set up by financial services people and government. And the financial services people there then become the heads of and uh, manage the authorities, especially including the Financial Conduct Authority, the Financial Ombudsman Service, and the Financial Services Compensation Scheme. So they they designed and enabled this, and they did so uh, not in the interest of clients, but in the industry, in the interests only of the industry. So we have the Financial Conduct Authority, and the Financial Conduct Authority says on its front page how we protect clients. We protect clients through the availability of the Financial Ombudsman Service and the Financial Services Compensation Scheme. It's on their website. This is a lie. Uh, HM Treasury set them up as separate uh, authorities. The FCA, the um, FOS, and the FSCS are totally autonomous, and they don't have to talk to each other, although they share information they don't have to share information and they in fact will use the fact that they don't have to talk to each other as an excuse for not acting uh, to step in. Like with the Ombudsman Service, I know one company um, that uh, had 220 complaints for pension investment mis-selling upheld against them and the FCA never stepped in to stop them trading. And they did this over about five years. Now, you think if someone has 200 complaints upheld against them for people lose all of their pensions, the FCA should step in and say, hang on, you're doing the wrong thing. We're going to ban you from being in the financial services industry. Well, they didn't. And that company is now being wound up by, liquidated by the ombudsman, ombudsman service, by the insolvency service, the official, the... Um, uh, the, the, anyway, the financial services, uh, not financial services, the insolvency service. But the issue with that is that none of the information that they glean will be published. Whereas with a, an insolvency practitioner and their liquidation, all the information, a lot of information is published and is on the public record. So we have these three organizations and they're all regulated by Treasury. They're not regulated by the FCA. They are only regulated by Treasury and the Prudential Regulation Authority. The, the, the name I was looking for was official receiver. Uh, and these are autonomous agencies. And then we have, these are the foxes. So the people who are guarding the foxes are sheep and toothless lions. And these are the IFAs, the rogue IFAs. And uh, they have credibility because they're regulated and you often get uh, advertisements and statements that you, you can trust your RFA because they're regulated. And we know that you can't trust people purely because they're regulated because the pot of gold, the, the chickens down the bottom, have so much money available that they don't control or touch or really quite often know about that uh, they become total game for the IFA. So the foxes are guarding the head house and they don't just guard it, they go in and pillage it. And then we have at the bottom, the impunity. The impunity is the uh, insolvency service. Uh, I have made 15 formal complaints to the insolvency service about uh, bad activity by insolvency practitioners for not recognizing uh, that uh, the only reason for insolvency was the upholding of complaints uh, by the Ombudsman Service and the failure of the professional indemnity insurers to compensate. Uh, I'll talk more about that later and I'll give you a case study. Okay, who are the participants that 
are particularly involved with financial fraud or uh, come pension uh, fraud. Who's involved? It's usually an onshore, offshore criminal enterprise investment company. Uh, the main thing is you've got to get the money you take from the pension into an offshore account. Once it's offshore, it's outside the jurisdiction of the, of the authorities in the UK, and they won't bother to look for it, will not. So the best place to put it is in a, a British protectorate, such as the Cayman Islands or Isle of Man. Uh, these uh, are perfect places because they have their own banking rules, although they are loosely connected with the Financial Conduct Authority, no one goes there and investigates, and they, and you open up a private bank account so that the criminal inve enterprise investment company can move their money uh, that you earned through the commission of moving the pensions into these crap investments, and no one can detect it. Okay, the, the average commission offered to a financial advisor is 30% of the money invested. So a hundred thousand uh, pound pension will get them thirty thousand pounds. It can go up to fifty thousand, fifty percent, and the lowest I've ever seen is twenty one percent. But thirty percent commission is a pretty big incentive to mislead people. The financial services regulator has no interest in supervising financial advisors. As I said, the way they protect is if anything goes wrong, you can complain. You can complain to the company and they'll always reject it. Then you complain to the Ombudsman Service and he can reject it or uphold it. The problem is vulnerable clients need to make good pension investment decisions. And that's the, that's the key to get them to participate in pension reviews. And uh, if you look at the British Steel Pension Scheme members, 8,000 of those were misadvised to transfer their pensions. You then also have uh, a very important part of the equation, which is the pension administration operators. Uh, these are the ones, they are regulated by the FCA and both the financial advisor and the pension administrator have within the, the rules they operate under uh, a requirement to ensure that pensions don't go into uh, high-risk, unregulated, uh, offshore, illiquid investments. Illiquid in that the investment must be one that you can liquidate to bring the money into the, the client's pension within 30 days. That's a very important uh, aspect. How IFA exacts with impunity. The FCA advises the public to trust IFAs. But as I said, there is no such protection because the IFAs are not supervised by the FCA. All they have to do is be, they have to pass exams. They have to pass uh, a an honest person's test, which I don't think exists. Uh, and uh, they uh, have to have 10,000 pounds in capital adequacy to operate uh, an IFA business. To operate a claims management company requires £20,000 capital adequacy, which is uh, a bit of a, uh, a contradiction, isn't it? They market to, uh, they market pension investment improvements to clients paid into offshore accounts. The IFAs then start a, a new company ready to phoenix their operations. In the example I'll give you, a, a real example, they op, they started it six to seven years before their company was put into liquidation uh, because they did it when they were starting to missell. They realised that they were going to get caught from miss by misselling and therefore they needed to have another company to move into, move their staff into, uh, although they didn't need the money, uh, most of these people doing this make tens of millions of pounds. This is not petty crime. This is, uh, and Sue Flood will back this up, tens if not hundreds of millions of pounds. When clients discover their pensions are empty or mostly gone, they complain. 
the company will always reject the complaints and expect many clients will go to the ombudsman service. Now, many clients, the majority of clients, 70% of people who get stiffed do not complain. They, uh, they are totally frazzled and put off by the system, don't understand how it works and don't trust the system. Uh, they hope someone will help them out, but um, majority don't, and they lose all of their retirement savings. So at that stage, the they take it to the Ombudsman Service. The IFA knows it's going to the Ombudsman Service, and we know you should know that the Ombudsman Service can uphold complaints. At the moment, they have a maximum payout uh, limit of three hundred and fifty-five thousand pounds. Now the problem is. The FCA, the, the Ombudsman Service, has no power to enforce uh, a, 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 a an upholding of a decision. No power at all. And the FCA, because they're a separate authority, has no interest or no involvement in going after the company to force them to pay, because companies are, have to have, are meant to have, professional indemnity insurance. You cannot find out if a company has professional indemnity insurance before you deal with them. And in almost all cases, the professional indemnity insurance will withhold payouts because they'll they'll say that it wasn't mis-selling, it was fraud, and they won't pay any out. You then find a friendly insolvency practitioner uh, who will wind up the company. And this is the this is the umbrella. Uh, uh, impunity that that exists. Uh, I can't see that with my little bar there. And then you continue with the new company and to spend your ill gotten gains. Has anyone got any questions or wishes to question anything I've said so far? Can I just put a, a general question to you? So I know there's no way you'd actually know the answer to this question, but what what sort of people are these people who can do this sort of thing and sleep at night? Well, maybe they don't. Do you have it? Do you ever feel for the kind of mindset or personality or value system of these well, people? Well, part, part of this is you can, if everyone else is doing it, why not you? It's the old Godfather uh, film principle. We won't sell drugs, but because we don't believe it's the right thing to do, but eventually they will sell drugs. And if you see everyone else ripping off people's pensions and there is the ombudsman service to go to and there is a compensation scheme to get your money back, even though it's not a fraction of what you lost, they, have, they can uh, settle their conscience with that knowledge that, hell, insurance is going to pay. What's the problem? Uh, it doesn't look into the devastation to people's lives, and and the the, the, the so you, the FOS says okay, you owe two hundred thousand pounds, pay it. Oh, uh, we'll put our company into liquidation so we can dump the creditors, and having to pay anyone, and then they can go to the FSCS, uh, and uh, you know there's nothing anyone can do about that because the FSCS. The FSCS is not allowed to sue IFAs or the directors of companies of IFAs. The Ombudsman Service is not allowed to sue IFAs or the directors of companies. Only the FCA and the police and whoever else can act. Martin White has a question. Thank you. Um, the scale of this story, if widely understood, would very reasonably um, reduce to almost nothing the public's confidence in the idea of if in doubt consult an IFA. Yeah. Um, it's evident that the whole system is so not fit for purpose, it's not true. But have you had the opportunity to present this story to a set of listening, interested MPs? Yes. Uh, and I've been dismissed uh, as. I don't know what I'm talking about. I don't understand how the system works. I've, they also have a vested interest in not upsetting the apple cart because the financial services industry is so powerful they could destroy any politician in a heartbeat. 
I then took all the, these issues, and I've been doing this for 12 years. I took these, this matter to uh, journalists. And journalists aren't interested because the main journalists who would be interested work for financial services publications. Uh, and they don't want to upset the apple cart and lose clients. And the industry itself doesn't want to hear these stories. And in fact, when they report uh, a, a company going into liquidation with hundreds of pension clients out of pocket, they never say, what was the motivation for the IFA to tell the clients to put their pension into a scam? They never talk about the hidden commissions. So there's a conspiracy of silence within the politicians. And I'm talking about Labor and Conservative. No one's interested. I, I, I have, I've got a, lots of correspondence. My, my MP was John Burko, uh, now this new guy. And he was very helpful in, in giving this information to uh, the, the Chancellor of the Exchequer, uh, the uh, Treasury. And no one, they always come back with a standard response that uh, you don't understand how the systems work. I've made official complaints to the insolvency service because the complaints I made about insolvency practitioners not finding that the grounds for or the reason for insolvency was mis-selling pension transfers, which under corporate company law is grounds to uh, ban directors. Uh, and that's pretty much the worst that happens. Recent, I've got an example here, I'll, I'll go into it later, that uh, this person was fined uh, two million pounds for misleading 650 pension scheme members to lose their pensions. Mm -hmm. Now, he would have made 12, 15 million pounds out of that. Two million pounds is nothing. But it makes the it makes the system look as though it's reacting. And this reaction was some seven years after the money was stolen. Yeah. So we have a system that simply doesn't work. And in fact, if they said it wasn't working, they've really got to build it from scratch again. You cannot you cannot turn a silk purse into a, sow, a sow's ear into a silk purse. And there is no will to do that with all the other problems that politicians perceive they have. We just heard Ken make a noise. That might be Ken asking you to come in for a question. Ken, did you did you want to come in here or did you just accidentally? Yes, I, I, I would. Uh, first of all, I'm astonished at, at that story. Uh, in Canada, the uh, the all the dealers that are registered with a regulator, uh, there's a called an investor protection fund. It's not huge, but it's a million dollars per account. So uh, if they go bankrupt, then you're covered. The uh, OBSI, the Ombudsman for Banking Services and Investment, can go up to three hundred fifty thousand dollars. Uh, they don't have a binding mandate yet. It's coming. Uh, but there's very, very few complaints that that are rejected and uh, that are accepted and the company doesn't pay. If they don't, there's a news release put out naming the company and the case is posted on uh, on the website. Uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, investor protection uh Groups such as at universities uh, that are free for people that can't afford a lawyer. Uh, I've sent I sent you that Andy a few times. Um, University of Toronto, uh, Western, and uh, they they have a full set of law students and, uh, supervised by a seasoned lawyer. Uh, and in our in Canada, the OBSI does not handle individual IFAs, or what, as we call them, FAs, it only deals with the company. The contract, the argument is the contract between a client is with the firm, not with uh, an individual. So and that, is the same, that, goal, is the same, that is the same here. So that that is who gets sued, is the company gets sued. So um, we're not great. But it sounds like, and we benchmarked FOS, so we have to double check. We found the FOS did have a binding mandate, albeit to a limit, but it could bind and enforce it, and it had to be paid, or you would 
be registered, deregistered, and they could get you in court. So I'm not no, sure the, what. No, the, the Ombudsman Service won't take anyone to court. Well, does, it, does, it, does the company get deregistered if they don't pay? Yes, they, they, no, they put themselves into liquidation. Uh, put themselves they, in liquidation. And they start okay. another, they've already started another company to trade, and no individuals are held accountable uh, because the company is responsible, even though the directors caused the, the loss. Uh, and uh, the, because the FCA regulates the company, individuals are never held responsible. And they can then uh, reform another company and keep and they can re re they can regulate that company under the FCA rules and start again. There's nothing to stop them. Oh, really? And in Canada, if you've been sanctioned and found guilty, you can be barred for up forever. Actually, be, you could be perpetually barred from getting involved with a, with a corporation in Canada. That is very rarely done here. When it's done, uh, it basically says you can't hold a senior position in financial services. But it's extremely rare. I've never heard of anyone being banned for life. And they don't care anyway because they've got their villa in Spain and all their money is in the Cayman Islands. Yeah. It was it was only through Peter explaining it to me one day that I, I saw this massive problem with our regulatory framework, which is that the bad deeds are done by individual human beings who are not accountable. It's the company that's accountable, and they therefore have a means by which they can duck and dive and um, get around the rules. So it's obvious, isn't it, that if you had a regulator that was actually taking out the bad individuals by banning them for life, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera you'd have an effective regime. And the senior manager certification regime has hardly ever been used. So it really does make you wonder whether yeah. the trade bodies and the City of London, et cetera, et cetera, are so powerful that they've made the system the way that it is. They, they've created this system to protect them because it's really protecting the big guys. That you know, the, 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 the big guys get protected, but they also get more regulation. There's you know, MIFID and... They have to change the way they do transactions and make them transparent. Yeah. But there's nothing to stop a guy on the on the ground, an IFA, lying to a client to steal their pension. There's nothing, and they can, and these IFAs can also start these offshore co investment companies, which they often do, and they get all of the money. That's well, definitely gotta, a pattern we've seen where where the people on the distribution side are actually bringing the business in bringing the money in, end up putting it in something that they've got some proprietary interest over and normally various conflicts of interest but over. They, they don't put it into a UK company because that that's very easy to trace. Yeah. So yeah. That, and if they do that, they get arrested and go to prison. But uh, it's it's a this is a well-known game that has been done uh, because also here, although you're you're acting as a fiduciary, and if you take, this goes to civil court, you'll always lose, the, the IFA will always lose. But because we have this system set up, which is a kangaroo court, uh, they they lose, they don't pay anything, and then they take their money and they start again. It, it's it's criminal. And yeah, it's, anyway, is, I'll, I'll carry is, Please do, Peter, just before you do, is there any data about how often this happens? Is there any num Are there any numbers anywhere that say that in the last five years, um, there's been you know, 3,065 no, no, refunds no, of no, IFAs. No, and you, and you can't get numbers from the Ombudsman Service. They used to put who the the, the scam investment companies were, but they failed, they failed to do that. They used to say how much per, the person, the money invested, and they no longer publish that. You can look at their decisions online, uh, put uh, Ombudsman decisions, but the information available uh, is very, very limited uh, it's hidden. It's it's. We don't want the people to know because we're fixing the system. Eventually, we won't have a bad system, but we'll always have a bad system because it's been designed to be bad. Hey, this is this is uh, very very powerful, very very potent stuff. Please do carry on, sir, and thank you for sharing your okay. twelve years' experience in this session tonight. Yeah, Please yeah. carry on. Thank well, you. that was also the money I lost years uh, trying to sue my bank, who then. Uh, countersued me and made me sign a gag order so I can't tell who the bank was and what the circumstances. Yeah. Although a BBC uh, documentary was made about it and um, 
uh, that's available, but I'm not mentioned in it and I can't even talk about it. Okay, kick them whilst they're down. What are you doing, Pete? Come on, here we go. Okay, what you do when you about before you close the company, you steal your client's records of for your own company. You ensure the new company has ten thousand pounds capital adequacy uh, required by the regulator to operate. You look after the liquidator with a guaranteed payment. Uh, the one liquidator I'm talking about here, he got a guaranteed payment of £103,000 to wind up a company. Uh, and another company was, was identical in circumstances, he charged £22,000. Uh, it's what, whatever they negotiate. Uh, and there are many, many liquidators who will take the £22,000, will not report what's called misfeasance, misfeasance being accidentally bad advice, where it's actually malfeasance, because it's deliberately bad advice to so that you will lose your money. You then use the client records to, to work with a claims manager company or law, or law firm to claim against your own company. And you'll make, and, and that, this has been published. You're not allowed to do that anymore, but how do you stop people doing a deal having that company contact all the clients because they've got all the client records yeah. and uh, representing them to get their money back and take 25% of the money. You create a bogus clone of the old company and then with the letterhead and all of the credentials, you promise the clients to pay, if they pay up front, two to five thousand pounds, you're guaranteed to recover their investments. And of course, that money goes into an account that is where the money's never seen again. So don't don't rip them off once. Don't rip them off twice. Rip them off three times. And we have lots of examples of this. Absolute client letters about how you'll get your money back. And in fact, because I'm interested in this and I, and I use uh, Instagram, uh, up come these, we can get your money back uh, services. And then the next Instagram messages, invest in off-plan, offshore uh, hotel units in uh, uh, Bulgaria, which will never be built. Okay, so you trade as a respectable IFA. Insolvency practices won't report bad direct behaviour because uh, they believe that's the job of the FCA. They, they're not in financial services. Insolvency practitioners are also autonomous, even if they're part of a big company with the, you know, the, the name of the company, like Quantuma, they're all individual officers of the court. The company cannot discipline them. They cannot tell them what to do. IPs are totally autonomous. They're regulated by, their, uh, their, by industry regulators, such as the ICAEW or the IPA. They're not regulated by the insolvency service. But to make a complaint about an, an, uh, an insolvency practitioner, you must make it through the insolvency service complaints gateway. And of the 15 that I've complained about, they've all been rejected. I'll, I'll go more into that later. So they won't uphold complaints against IPs. I guarantee you that. I, I've been down this path so exhaustively, but it was a very good learning process. So I know all complaints will go to the IP regulators, and there are different regulators for Northern Ireland, England and Wales, and Scotland. The, and, but they're the industry regulators. They're, they're the, the, the insolvency practitioners who set up these regulators uh, to regulate their friends. It's, it's, it's no, never going to happen. You access stolen funds offshore via, generally via family trusts, uh, and you, you can move the money into your family trust or into your wife's trust or it's there, there are many people who will tell you how to access the money and i know sue flood would know about fast pensions uh they stole 10 million pounds uh it was published in in in, in the newspapers uh on boxing day a few years ago and no one no one read it Remember, the Ombudsman Service had no power to act against directors. However, the insolvency practitioner can act against the director. 
uh, because of the misfeasance or malfeasance perpetrated uh, in misadvising persons that led to the company going into liquidation. Only reason that the company went into liquidation was because they couldn't pay the compensation demanded by the Ombudsman Service. And once it's in insolvency, directors can be held personally liable. And we have done this within association with uh, insolvency solicitors and uh, liquidate, uh, litigation funders. We particularly work with Assertus uh, and Roger Dugan, our contact there. He's ex um, Manalay. And they understand this intimately and they will sue. The, as long as the, the directors seem to have assets, they will sue them. They will buy the action and they will sue them. And a lot of money will go to into the creditors. Uh, but as I said earlier, the FSCS can't sue directors. They're banned from suing directors for mis misfeasance to get money for themselves so they can pay more compensation without going, putting a levy on the industry. Uh, now and again, the FCA acts against directors, but it's long after the event. And it's highly publicised. Uh, they might get banned by uh, by the insolvency services company directors, but who cares if you've got £10 million in the bank offshore? Okay. Argent Wealth is the still in liquidation. I am not saying that Argent Wealth and the directors did what I've just said. I am not saying they did that. But I will now spell out what they did do, and you can make your own observations and assumptions. So Argent Wealth, FCA regulated company, uh, set up by a man called David Hardman. Uh, that's that's like the case study. Incorporated in 2009, began being regulated in April 2000. And this is all available on the Financial Conduct Authority and Companies House website. This is no one made this up, and I didn't buy this information. They traded as a number of names, but in particular, they traded as Carlton Smith Private Wealth. The some of the approved persons, David Harbin was the main was the director of the company, along with her, I think is his wife, and the people who are authorized to provide uh, pension and investment advice included David Harbin and Nick Nicholas Carlton Smith. Three pension complaints were upheld against them. And you can read the pension uh, decisions uh, in February 2015 and then June and August uh, 2021. David Hardman, I've got John Hardman, David Hardman set up uh, another company, DMH Private Wealth, in June 2014. And that company became regulated in January 2016 with the trading name Carlton Smith Private Wealth. Because trading names, unless you trademark them, and the trading name is only, uh, not doesn't have to be used, but is known by the FCA, there's no problem at all. And it had no capital adequacy, so it couldn't actually provide financial services advice until 2020, 21. And that's uh, that's on the uh, on their company uh, report that when they finally had enough money so they could trade. Why have two re FCA regular companies with the same director trading concurrently? I mean, it's interesting. Why would you do that? Why would you have another company with all the different capital adequacy and, well, why not? All complaints, all three complaints, were based on misadvising pension investment transfers. The FCA took no action against the company or the people who worked there, were authorised to work there. Uh, they didn't, just didn't do it. David Hardman ceased being FCA regulated at, with Argent in December 2019. This is an interesting date because you can see uh, just after that, that, the year after that, he re got uh, capital adequacy for DMH Private Wealth, trading as Carlton Smith Private Wealth, um, and it was a seamless transfer. 
Um, you then put argent wealth into liquidation with an insolvency practitioner liquidator called Richard Rendell in July 2021. So he had another company ready to go. He stopped being regulated in December 2019 because he was already regulated under, under his new company, DMH Private Wealth, and then he put the company into liquidation with Richard Rendell. But I'm not saying that there was they did anything wrong. What's in system? Okay, in the liquidator's statement of affairs, which is available on Companies House, just go to Argent Wealth and go into uh, their uh, filing system. And the liquidator said that there were cash assets of £233,000, but this didn't include money that was going to come in through follow-on commissions paid by uh, companies that they do business with. Non-secured creditors, trade and expenses, uh, employees, registered individuals, so directors' loans, and client client complaints were registered as five hundred thousand pounds. So we have a deficiency of four hundred and thirty-six thousand pounds. Does anyone want me to explain that? This is what the liquidator. Uh, this is information the liquidator got expressly from David Hardman. It. it it was was verified uh, and changed uh, when he did his first report a year later. Uh, moving on. So a year later, he published the liquidated report. Assets uh, asset realizations are three hundred and twenty. So we now have five hundred and fifty thousand pounds. In his own report, Richard Rental said he prevented the FCA contacting clients about the liquidation and their ability to claim through the Ombudsman service. Can you explain that bit, Peter? Why? Well, the, he said uh, on, his, on his report that uh, he can, he, only he is allowed to authorise contact of clients. And uh, the FCA said, we want to write to them and tell them that, you know, they, they should claim. Uh, and he said, no, you're not allowed to. I will do that. And so he is said to have done that, but I haven't seen the letter and I don't know what he said in that letter. Hmm. Uh, so who knows? He also refused to accept the FC FSES's claim the clients were misadvised. He said his reasons for that was, only he, the liquidator, can make a decision whether clients were misadvised. It is not within the FC FSCS's remit, which meant that claims lodged by the FSCS for payments that they, for claims they upheld, remember the maximum was 80, 85,000, they registered 881,000 claims because although they could only pay out 85,000, they registered all that was lost. They do a calculation on how much was lost, and the average loss was two hundred and twenty thousand pounds, and they would have got eighty eighty five thousand pounds less twenty five percent plus that. They would have got seventy percent of eighty five thousand pounds. Of course, almost all everyone uses a lawyer or a claims management company. Rendell paid himself one hundred and five thousand pounds to do this work. One of the assets he's meant to sell are the client records, and also what happens if. If an IFA business goes out of business, the FCA insists that these people aren't treated as what's called orphans, that a new IFA steps in to look after them. This didn't happen. The, the FC, he said in his report, he gave the client records to the FCA, but wouldn't allow them to write to them. Now, he meant to sell the records to another IFA so that they can help clients get back on the track with their pensions. He said he, no one was interested in buying them because the bank account had been closed and without verifying the transactions, uh, no one would make an offer, which is a lie because the insolvency practitioner can has all the ground, grounds in the world to demand the, client, the, the bank records from the bank. 
No, no doubt about that. But he lied in his in his report. I then got one IFA that we I'm very close to to contact him without saying it was me behind it and make an approach to buy the client records. Rendell uh, said he would it would require twenty thousand pounds for him to investigate whether he could get the client records uh, to sell. Uh, and of course, my contact said, well, I would just pay £20,000 for a promise to investigate. So it didn't go any further. Okay, moving on. Here's, uh, here's uh, what was said in the press uh, about Argent. British Steel Advisor fails. Um, Archer Bell, an independent financial advisory firm, that's one of the companies associated with the British Steel Pension Scheme scandal, may also know that as Carl Smith, Private Well, Wealth, and these were the other trading names. And then number two, which is very important, Argent Wealth, a renowned independent financial advisory firm, shattered the hopes and financial security of British Steel workers with the mis their misleading recommendations between 16 and 18 an estimated 1,500 British steel workers were advised by Argent to transfer out of their final salary pension scheme. But there's nothing to see. So the records of compensation will be paid by the FSCS. We, we read those when we're appointed by an, an insolvency practitioner. We, we can't share that information, of course. We don't have those records. So there's no record of how much money was lost by those 1,500 British steel workers and the insolvency practice did not report David Hartley for uh, acting contrary to the interests of his clients as required by company law. This is fact. Okay, what did I try? What did I try? I really picked the cudgel up on this, and I tried to get something done. January twenty-two, I uh, emailed Richard Rendell to say we would undertake a free or contingent fee regulatory misfeasance investigation of Argent. He said, "There's nothing to investigate." In February, I wrote to him, now getting serious, to say, "I believe you're not acting in the best interests of your creditors." Uh, because uh, uh, he, he hadn't reported bad behaviour. Uh, and uh, I, I gave him chapter and verse as to why he should do what I was suggesting. He threatened me with legal action. This is all in the emails. In March, I wrote to Nick, the MP, Nick Smith, uh, about the what was going on, and he didn't respond. Well, he responded, but didn't go any further. In March, I made a complaint to the Insolvency Service Complaints Team about Rendell. They looked at the report he wrote about the director and said it did not correlate with what I'd said about Rendell. And therefore, if he hadn't read, uh, written anything about it, and, uh, and I said, I think Rendell is hiding uh, the bad things that have been done by the director, they said there's no case to answer. I appealed that decision by the Insolvency Service. It was rejected. I then wrote to the head of the collections uh, uh, at the FSCS that there needs to be action against Hardman because he's still regulated. And that's when I learned that the FCS, FSCS is not allowed to take action against directors. If they did, things would change. In September, I complained to the FCA about failures by Hardman and, and Rendell because Re Rendell has to be approved by the FCA to liquidate a regulated company. In, in March 2023, I could not let this go. I complained to the insolvency service that their complaints policy for IFAs and complaints about IPs uh, was inadequate and flawed. They invited me for a Zoom call. And these are the people who operate the complaints gateway. The complaint was given to them to sort out. Uh, and they basically said I didn't know what I was talking about. Uh, they invited me. They got an invitation for me to attend an insolvency practitioner's uh, uh, training event in Cardiff, and uh, they introduced me to the R three organisation, which is the industry organisation that represents 
insolvency practitioners and they asked me to write an article. I wrote the article uh, in their magazine recovery and no one's contacted me about it. Okay, here's, here's a recent thing and there's been more since then. Here's Darren Reynolds uh, gave dishonest advice to 670 pension transfers, including 150 British Steel pension schemes. Remember, 8,500 British Steel pension scheme people were misadvised to transfer their pensions. Uh, he, this, is, this is the FCA. He knew that the investments were not suitable. No one said that they were scams. I mean, why would you put your money into truffle trees in another country? We all know that truffles don't grow on bloody trees, but that's a fact. The, the regulator also fined Andrew Deeney and banned him from working in financial services uh, because he followed up by giving more unsuitable advice and he had 200,000 pounds of commission payments that are known. No one talked about the commission payments that are not known. Uh, it's not worth it for 200,000 pounds. It's worth it for 10 million pounds. Uh, Deeney bought the client records of Active Wealth uh, and started with another company called Fortuna Wealth, that's just looking after the clients. And then he lied to the FCA about the advice he was given. Uh, the uh, FSCS have, have uh, published that they've paid out 20 million pounds to clients. Uh, but if the cap of 85,000 pounds wasn't in place, they would have paid out 42 million pounds. And as I said, only 30% of people claim it. So you do your sums and you see that hundreds of people uh, are crying into their Weetabix. There, many people commit suicide, uh, family breakdowns. This ruins lives. But the F there's the FSCS to pay your compensation and the, om the ombudsman to arbitrate on decisions. So why are you complaining? The system is in place to look after you. So back to the runners and riders uh, and how they play the system. Uh, and I have had 12 years of experience of this. Uh, I believe I know what I'm talking about. Peter, uh, I, I feel absolutely peed off hearing this. Um, it, it ties together so many things that, that people on the Zoom board have experienced. People like Diane, people like Sue and, and many, many others. Um, I don't mind telling you, I feel absolutely flat on the floor about the mountainous task of having to fix the system because the system's not just broke, it's actually deliberately broke. It's, designed, the, it's designed to be broken. The, the way the incentives work, you know, every, every actor is behaving in a particular way because it suits them to do so. So it's not a case of just fixing something. It's a case of fixing something that wants to stay broken. That's the problem. And how do you do that? Because it, it, there is collusion. They, there are there's promises between the various bodies, such as the insolvency services and, and the uh, Financial Conduct Authority and the City of London Police and the police that we have a way of handling these things and we're not going to change it because it's not broken. Would anybody like to come in with any initial comments and questions? Um, in, in, a moment, in a moment, we're going to in in a moment we're going to go to Diane and Steve and maybe Sue Flood and others if you want to talk. But does anybody have any initial comments or questions? Martin, uh, I, his hand. Uh, Martin, thank you very much indeed. Thanks for explaining that. Cheers, um, Martin. Please yeah, share. No, thank you. Thank you. Um, Peter, this is convincing. But it's entirely in line with everything I have believed for some long time. I, I won an essay competition on this basic topic. Um, it was an essay competition run by the Institute and Faculty of Actuaries with the head judge, John Kay. Uh, and it's in the public domain. And uh, I put a link um, in the in the chat. Um, I think the idea of influencing politicians is not the place to start. You can only influence them if there's sufficient public outcry for them to feel it's a matter of votes. I think the most effective way to really make a difference is to find a way of being listened to by the public without the politicians stopping you. In other words, um, 
pointing out that even the advice, if in doubt, consult an IFA mm -hmm. is no blimmin' use to you. Um, I would say, if somebody asks me um, how they go about getting advised, et cetera, et cetera, I would say there's one principle. Never let anyone take a percentage of your money. In other words, don't pay an IFA other than time spent and never actually give your money to anybody well, apart from very carefully on platforms. But but the, but the system has a way around that. All the IFAs, it gives you advice on what to do with your pension. You don't have to accept that advice and you're told to trust him. So, uh, yeah, the, but my, my, my advice is don't trust the IFAs and find ways of avoiding the, the so-and-sos. You need them. They, they are really essential. Uh, um, but... Well, I don't think it's good enough. If you no, find a duff, yeah. Well, if you find a duff one, and you get screwed like this, that's false confidence. So the system's not good enough. So whilst most of IFAs might be okay, the simple uh, advice to consult an IFA is not good enough because the system's not fit for purpose. Yeah. Interesting stuff. Uh, thank you very much indeed, Martin and Peter. Thank you for your talk. Um, I'm going to go to Diane Bentley next, uh, subject to anybody else have any comments or questions that they want to come in on. So please uh, wave your hand at me literally or digitally. Uh, oh, we have London Latter Healing on Earth. That's an interesting name. So please introduce yourself. Of course, let us know what your actual name is, London Latter Healing on Earth. I'd be lovely to hear from you. My people. name is Latter. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I love this topic but i think uh we've got our hands tied behind our backs and we need to really untie each other and get together on this um and not be afraid we've got to really stand up and get some proper robust barristers and um you know legal eyes on this uh, to really challenge these guys who just roll off, you know, lies because this is happening across the industry, not just pensions. It's happening with the bankers. Um, they're screwing people from with with, with pensioners from their pension pots, uh, and uh, where else? Uh, so many people are just getting away with it, you know. Um, what, what, what is that, that's a really interesting. What's your connection to this space? Are you a, a former advisor or uh, something? Have you been ripped off yourself? If you don't mind telling us, Lata, please, please help us understand. No, uh, my, my experience is that I've experienced, you know, I've, I've used all these things across the industry. Yeah. Um, so I've used, I'm a, you know, service user. Yeah. Uh, so I've used um, pensioners um, because I had my own private pension, but yeah. he screwed up as well. And I don't know how to get any compensation from that. Um, he admitted he did wrong. But how do I hold him to account? And like you said, you know, we need their PIs, really. Yeah. And this should be a compulsory thing on their on their websites, who okay. their professional indemnifiers are, it shouldn't be kept a secret. Well, quite a lot of them don't have professional and, indemnity insurance. And concealed. And, and, the, and the professional indemnity insurance won't pay out because they know uh, that they lied to their clients. But then so what's the point? Then we're not protected, so then we can't like invest. It looks like the system We can't says, invest. But the system says... You're protected. Look, we put these things in no, place. That's what I'm saying. They're lying through their teeth and that's we right. need to awaken right. everyone. Like they said, smoking was fine. But now we found out that it was giving people lung cancer and NHS was funding it. So, I mean, now they're putting it, the warning on the cigarette boxes. So someone spoke up, you see, uh, a group, activists. It's not just one person, Peter, that can go around well, no, doing that's this. What, that's what the, we, that's we, what the we have to be an army, don't for. we? But it's 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 such a a huge problem. Yeah. I I can't see it ever being solved. Uh, 
but no I, but I, if we get together we can make a difference but if we stay individuals we can't make much because we tire out you can't it, find it there needs to be a public voice that's loud enough and enough people that agree with for any action to be taken but th there is none there none is this there is a group called uh, APPG, I think. Um, they they sort of uh, in the parliament yeah. alternative. Let me let me tell you, the APPG, the 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 MPs on that committee, are taking a private action against the Financial Conduct Authority, a private action at their own financial risk as individuals, mm. uh, because the Financial Conduct Conduct Authority refused to accept and agree that a fraud was undertaken uh, by a company which stole millions of pounds. And mm. we are, uh, Andy is chairman of the APPG. Uh, so we, we, he is very involved with the APPG. They can't get anything done. Yeah. So what, what do we need is then insurance. Uh... We need to take out some insurance, legal insurance, to take against to 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 act against these guys. So we have an endless pot as well to fight them because we can't pay out. So we have to protect ourselves with getting an insurance policy. In, in, uh, in, in my opinion, in my opinion, um, mm. I think the UK is heading for the need for a royal commission like they had in Australia. Yep. Uh, the, the financial system in Australia was rotten. Mm. The journalists got onto it and mm. they basically said enough is enough. Uh, people are being ripped off left, right and centre. Yeah. We need a proper overhaul of the entire system. That resulted in what's called a royal commission and it's done some heavy duty change. I'm coming round to thinking the UK needs something like that overhaul yep. of the entire system because it's yeah. not fit for purpose. Lata, thank you so much for yeah, we do. contributing we to do. our conversations today. Thank you very much. No, we do that. need that. And uh, like you say, it's it's the vulnerable people. And when yeah. we're on our own, and the FOS is absolutely useless. Yeah, yeah. It might not be there. It sounds like we're very much on the same wavelength. Thank you, Lata. Let's go to Diane Bentley. Um, th this whole thing is a bit of a sore subject for you. I know that. I know that this has not been mm. for you to listen to, Diane, but please just share your reflections on what's been said so far. Thank you. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, it would be lovely to take uh, them through the uh, legal system, but unfortunately, I, I mean, I know of two cases that are going off now and it's it's a half a million pound job. And I think that the IFAs, they know that. The IFA companies, the trustees, the insurance companies, they all know that. And they know that they won't get taken to court unless there can be a class action. And I think that's the only way to do it. And because yeah. there are so many IFAs, so many trustees, so many insurance companies, you just can't get enough people together with the same situation. Um, it's very, It's very difficult. But anyway, I'm in Europe, I'm in France, and uh, my husband and I were uh, persuaded to, to transfer our pensions offshore, uh, which was an absolute disaster. It's like the Wild West here. Um, and, you know, we've now had two IFAs and two sets of trustees, and we have been very disappointed with them all. And it, it seems abroad that, because it's commission led, because they can take commissions abroad and they are often hidden, um, that people are being put in extremely risky funds, which which those poor people have lost significant amounts of their pensions or some of them have lost it all. Um, or the other thing that happens is that there's just so many fingers in the till, uh, yeah. of these cure ops, that they just never make any money at all. What, what, what you're not saying is that 30% of your pensions that were invested have gone in secret commissions back. Yeah. So how yeah, could 70%? I, I think 30%, certainly for the people I know, that's probably a bit high. Um, I don't think it's quite as much as that, but, but it's, these are, these it's are significant. Secret, these are secret illegal commissions. They take a commission on top of that of 3% for the, the advice and the transfer, and they take a percentage, 1% or 2% every year for looking after your investments. 
It's, oh, right. If you if you look at it that way, Peter, you, you're absolutely... But, the, but, but there's no money in the bloody investment because they stole it. Yeah. It's, so And you can't find out where the money is. Yeah. Yeah. It, it is it is really difficult to find out the exact commissions that are, are taken out but basically the regulations are just so bad out here and remember we've got we've got three companies involved in the cure ops we've got the IFA and and I hesitate to call them IFAs they're actually salespeople um very often they are untrained uh well certainly they've not got professional qualifications um and you know there's so many conflicts of interest that's that's going off here so then you've got the trustees involved uh yeah. on top of that you've got the insurers companies who put the whole blooming pension into a into an insurance wrapper which you know a isn't necessary and b is really and you, know, and you can't touch to your do. money for 10 years you can't touch your money for 10 years you don't even know where it is well you can you can we were locked into quilter uh, paying 1.25 just to the insurance company for for eight years we we were locked in um so you know that that was a long time we're out of it now we should only be paying about 500 euros a year to use their platform after all that time um but i've been told that there are ways and means that money can still be taken out and that you would never know so yeah, yeah. sorry i think i think ken ken wants to Ask me something. Um, my suggestion, and it worked in Canada, it may not work there, but this is a 20 year war. This is not a, this is a long game. Uh, we tried with politicians. We just decided guerrilla warfare. So what we uh, did, and it's been slow, but we've done a lot. We are at the, uh, finally at the stage of the ombudsman having a binding decision mandate. Um, we're trying to get a special fund that if, 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 if the company goes bankrupt and can't make the payment, it'll come out of a special fund that had, had to be funded by the industry. Uh, we have uh, arranged for the restricted funds from regulators, all the fines they collect, to get access to that to help build at least one organization in Canada, Fair Canada, and they've given them, I, I'm guessing, five or 10 million to make sure there's at least one well-financed uh, investor advocacy group. Uh, we have uh, encouraged uh, uh, legislation, and it, it did get passed. It's not great, though, class action. Uh, class actions have been quite effective. Uh, we've uh, encouraged whistleblowing laws with uh, regulators providing substant not quite like the SEC, but pretty substantial awards for whistleblowers. Um, we've got uh, university uh, investor protection groups, they're called. Uh, it's two universities. We're going to try to get it in every, every province. We'll have at least one financed by a regulator, which will help people who don't have enough money to take, a, take on an action. Uh, we work very closely with media. We've cultivated four or five newspapers. We've got those journalists that really are attuned to what we what we say. Uh, we've tied up with poverty groups, Seed and Acorn and uh, Prosper Canada. We've teamed up with one of the best has been CARP, the Canadian Association of Retired Persons, and CanAge, which is a law firm that specializes in elder abuse. So it's been, uh, you know, you'd, I, we once had a big chart on the wall showing all the webs that we had to attack uh, pretty well simultaneously with quite a group. And that's why we, we ended up, we didn't get any financing, but uh, we did find about 250 volunteers across Canada, mostly retired engineers like myself, but some mathematicians, some lawyers, uh, some ex-regulators. And uh, I think if you asked around, you would find that when the Ken Meyer Associates name is involved with something, uh, they'll listen. Uh, we intervene sometimes, I have the energy um, with individual complaints. So because we find most complainants do not even know how to file a complaint, how to word it properly, and if it's rejected, what to do with it, because there's a lot of abandonment of complaints. So my 
my only comment would be, it sounds like you have a, a rough situation there with no, no champion to be found in government, uh, either party or any party, and you need to declare a state of war and you need uh, multiple uh, tactical strategies. And um, the primary thing is to get one or two major fundings out of the FCA, I guess it would be. Maybe there's another one for different sectors and get tens of millions of pounds out of them and have them fund these guys. And, they, then, and then they know they've got an adequate staff to deal with all the company lobbyists and the law firms that represent the, the, the industry you'll have a fair chance. We've made limited progress. Pretty, I would say the way it was going, it would be no progress, would be retrogression. But now we've got the positive momentum. If, if, if there's another way, we could never find it. We could not get any other way. So it was funding, getting the media involved, getting universities involved, partnering. We also partnered with the uh, group in the government that handles people that cannot handle their own money. They find out elderly people, no family, and uh, they have different names in Canada, but every province has a, a, a funded, it's funded by the government, but they, you have to pay them 2% fee, but they'll take over that elder person's or incompetent person's money. And if you talk to them, they'll tell, tell you, how, you know, how much money there could have been if you know, they discover yeah. has been robbed of they them. Can, but but we partner with them as well. So there's, yeah. it's, it's a multi-pronged attack and simultaneous, and eventually it'll converge, I hope. But this industry is, uh, is, is based, based on greed. And it, I, don't, I think it's part of the uh, genetics. So we, we just assume it is, and we will just keep attacking it with another yeah. genetic code. The, the problem the problem is Ken that we've got we've got three different jurisdictions involved we've got perhaps in my case we've got an IFA in France we've got the trustees who are in Malta and we've got the insurance company that's in Ireland now those those three different jurisdictions they all point the finger at each other and nobody will take responsibility for it so that's that's a major stumbling block to even, even having people um, take responsibility for, for what's happened to our pensions. I think that's a massive, massive thing. I mean, I was told by the Irish ombudsman that cure ops were far too complex, I have it in writing, for her to deal with. And therefore the, the solution that she recommended was that I took them to court. That's three different people in three different jurisdictions, you know. Now, to me, if the Irish Ombudsman finds cure ops too difficult um, and complex to deal with, then Ireland shouldn't be involved with them, as well, far as I'm concerned. Yeah. But, well, read, but, read uh, a book called The Art of War. I'm sure you've heard of it. <laughs> read it and, and truly understand it. And I think you'll come up. There is always going to there is a strategy. It's not it won't be perfect. You need to come up with a strategy for your jurisdiction in your environment but you, it is war and i think you need to think of it as, as a state of war and mm -hmm. if you, once we decided that things started getting better right yeah, away but the thing is that you're fighting professionals and your laypersons it's it's an imbalance a huge chasm here going on what, what these was, people shouldn't be allowed to trade to, we became experts be put out quickly. straight away what we're going to this do, folks, well, bear, bear with me. What we're going to do, folks, in a moment mm. is we're going to hear from Steve Conley, who's going to be building on the theme of what can be done on the solution side. Um, thank you, Ken, for your input. I, I've got such vivid memories, Ken, of the conversation you, me, and Mark Bishop had when you started to teach us about the art of guerrilla warfare. And um, you, you're as potent now as you were in that conversation. Your input's spot on. And, I, and later on, I'm going to talk about Better Finance, Fair Canada, and the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. But what we're going to do now is... Yeah, but Andy, talk. can I just stop so, you Sorry, not now. Minute. Sorry, can I'm sorry. No, I'm, yeah. going to, I'm going to say no because I need to manage the time for everybody's benefit, okay? So, I've got to get off, by the way, in about I five know. minutes. I, I, I know you do, Ken. So we're going to go to Steve Conley, and then we're going to circle back to, and uh, go from there. So just hold your point for me, Lata, and uh, we'll go to Steve. Thank you. Great. Uh, right, thanks for that. Uh, so... I've been a pension professional since the 1980s. 
<clears throat> headed up pensions for the biggest insurance companies and banks in the world. So uh, Royal London Insurance Company, a head of pensions there, uh, head of pensions for HSBC Bank, Royal Bank of Scotland Group, uh, Santander. And I packed it all in 12 years ago to fight this war. <laughs> uh, joined, joined with Andy in the Transparency Task Force uh, and the uh, founding lead of the Market Integrity Team. And uh, like you say, it's a 20 year, it's going to be 20 years. And that's kind of the news uh, before we can affect uh, the regulators, the parliamentarians, the unaccountable powers uh, of, you know, of, of profit that are in these various um, positions that are just, we're unable to deal with. So I basically, 12 years ago, started a company called the Academy of Life Planning. And basically, um, my belief is that there, there can be no integrity in the financial services market unless we place a wall between advice and product. So what I've started is a movement, of a global movement now of non-intermediating financial planners. And we have non-intermediating financial planners in uh, five continents, in Canada and US as well, Far East. India is quite interesting because uh, the regulator there is um, SEBI, the uh, Securities and Exchange uh, Board of India, have actually um, they banned financial advisors and financial planners from using the term financial advisor or financial planner if they also sell products. So you are not allowed to call yourself a financial planner or a financial advisor of any kind if you sell products, you have to call yourself a mutual fund distributor or whatever. Anyway, that's what should happen here. There should be a wall between advice and products. So I started a movement, a guerrilla movement, like I say, it's growing. Uh, because when big change from top down takes 20 years, the only way to change your market is from the bottom up. So that's what I've been doing. Um, quite a loud voice um, advocating for the non-intermediating financial planners on social media. I have a lot of following and quite controversial. I uh, write for, I'm a columnist for Money Marketing, um, also uh, FT Advisor as well. So I'm also you know, making the story that there needs to be a wall between advice and product because we don't need, so I disagree with the comment that was said earlier, we don't actually need financial advisors. What we need is financial planners. Uh, financial planning is not a regulated activity if it's not done with a view to intermediation. It's a standalone piece of activity. You're a fixed fee and, and you get professional on your side of the table that levels the playing field with this uh, information symmetry. So when my clients are thinking about doing a pension transfer, I sit on the client side of the table and the regulated advisor is sat in front of me trying to explain why it is that the client should move. And uh, I'm, like I say, for, since 1989, I've been a, a chartered uh, pension professional since then. And uh, now I have uh, about 500 other planners in my mm -hmm. network across the, across the globe who are doing the same thing for their clients. So basically, we see ourselves as the, the financial bodyguard, the professional ally. Uh, we just do fixed fees. Um, and we, what we deliver is called generic financial planning advice. If anyone needs any regulated advice, then, yep, I'll invite them into my ring. And now we'll sit on the other side of the table, listen to what they've got to say. Uh, I also run a number of asset recovery companies. So a Asset Recovery Network UK. So this is basically trying to recover money that's been scammed. Um, billions of pounds uh, that I'm dealing with in on an international basis with that, but also involved in some other smaller uh, for personal client um, recovery companies like this uh, Safe or Scam or the Fraud Team. I've had to stand back from that because I was starting to get threatened by the, uh, the scammers <laughs> who were threatening to come around my house and do things to me and my family. So I don't appear very uh, high profile on that. They start to attack my business and stuff like that. But anyway, my argument is that what we need in the industry is um, a wall between advice and product and we needs to be a, a blue water should be no incentive 
and you know how to make bring about that change because the regulator is not going to do it the um the government aren't going to do it they're they're obliged to protect the city uh, they want london to remain to be the financial capital of the world they don't want any um inconvenient regulations interfering with that so that's where they're coming from that's why it's going to take so long to change things so i change things by telling the customers telling the people um, telling them that you can actually get financial planning on its own um, i also when you remove financial intermediation you suddenly can make a, a generic financial planning advice available to everybody so uh, i do a lot of work for free I do a lot of work. Uh, so the starting proposition that I have is £19 a month. And for that, 90% um, of people, 90% of the time can be that run their own financial matters with their own, uh, with the right support. So I provide that support. I provide the tools, I provide the education, provide the communities uh, on a very, very low ticket price. And we're trying to get that down to £3 a month with working in worksite marketing and bring it to employers. And uh, basically my goal is to empower people. My goal is to, uh, it's called decentralization. Rather than your pension company, your IFA or your trust trustees looking after your money, I think the data and the information ownership should be with the end user, with the client. So it's called decentralization. So what I'm trying to do is decentralize. And so we have tools that end users use to manage their own money. And uh, if they need, um, in times of stress or change, they need one-to-one -one support, I can give them that on an hourly basis. And then I disappear out back out of the equation again. So um, the aim is to empower, the aim is to uh, democratize, the aim is to decentralize and put ownership we do that in a guerrilla way, social media, um, lots of fans, loud voice in the press, loud voice on LinkedIn, Facebook, TikTok, Instagram. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so that's that's kind of my my personal battle. I don't think I've left anything out there, Andy. No, you, you, you've not. Probably the single most important thing. Uh, I personally think in relation to the way that Steve works, he's, he's basically built a proposition that has actually stripped out the conflicts of interest between the agents and the clients. Um, that's the key here. It's, it's, it's conflicts of interest that ruin the issues. I can see Martin applauding this. The idea of having somebody sitting on your side of the table acting for you and only for you Paying that person a reasonable amount of money for doing so, that's what you need. Uh, that, that's what you need. We've had some great, great sessions here. I'm going to um, thanks Steve, very much for your, your comments. Thank you, Diane, also, and Peter, yours as well. I'm going to share with you folks in the next five minutes or so something of a vision uh, in terms of the long-term future of either the Transparency Task Force or something else. So I'm 59, and as I think some of you know, I've dedicated my work in life in the last X years to the TTF, and it's cost me a lot. I'm not just talking financially, it's cost me a lot. And the only way Transparency Task Force makes sense in my mind is if it is something that continues after I'm gone whether that be through me getting run over by a bus or being taken out um, or retiring. You know, it's at some point in time, I have to let go of the TTF. And of course, I want to and plan to do that in a gradual way over a period of time. But it takes me to the question, what needs to exist that could work without me? And the answer is, it would need to be some kind of entity that's properly structured, properly resourced. And this is the point that Ken was speaking to earlier when he mentioned Fair Canada. So let me just share with you 
what I believe are three uh, particularly good examples of um, of what the long term future of the TTF could be if we were to go down the direction of travel that I'm um, I'm talking about. Now, by the way, I genuinely don't care if it was my organisation I've built from scratch that evolves into what I'm about to describe, or if it was another organisation that somebody else builds. In fact, to be perfectly honest with you, if somebody else was able to do this, it would mean that the next X years of my life are going to be easier and better paid because I would not have to be making the sacrifices I do now to do it. So whilst I talk about this as being something TTF could evolve into, if XYZ organisation were to do it instead, I'm absolutely fine about that. You know, I don't care which player gets the board in the back of the net. I just want the goal to be scored if you if you get my drink. So um, this is an organisation called Better Finance. Um, Better Finance is European. It is 50% funded by the state. They have got a great big budget. They have got proper employees, an office, resource. Um, and very, very importantly, and this is a key, key point, they are a part of the established landscape within the European uh, infrastructure. Why, why is that so important? I'll explain. I've actually drawn this once, but I'll just try to do it visually. You're either part of the system you're trying to change or you're outside it. If you are outside the system you are trying to change, you spend, and I know this for a fact, you spend 60, 70, 80, 90, 95, 96% of your energy trying to engage with the system that you're trying to change. It is a horrifically inefficient model. The amount of time and energy TTF spends getting to talk to politicians, uh, regulators, policy makers, it's enormous. And every now and then we get a result, but it's like one in 10 of our efforts get somewhere. Nine out of 10 don't. Because we're outside of the system trying to break into it. It's almost like we're burglars having to burgle our way into the property before we can mix something. That's a ridiculous way of explaining it but you get my gist 90 percent of the effort is breaking into the thing we're trying to change whereas better finance is part of the landscape it's part of the european uh, machinery so a high proportion of their energy is actually spent making change happen as opposed to finding ways to engage with the people that can make change happen so all else being equal, if we had the same money as them and the same resources as them, but we were outside the system and they were inside it, they would wipe the floor with TTF. So therefore, we, TTF, or whichever organisation gets the ball back in it, has got to grow into something that is actually a part of the established order of things, where it's on the inside, making change from the inside. Now, interestingly, one thing that connects this organization, the next one I'm going to show you, is the global financial crisis. Because in Europe, what happened was when the global financial crisis happened, the Europeans got well angry. And they basically said, enough's enough. Uh, these bankers have got too much control, too much influence. We're going to take them down a peg or two. We're going to restructure the way financial advice and stuff is done. Blah, 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 blah. And we're going to get the government to fund a proper heavy duty pro consumer organization. And that's what better finance is. And whilst things in Europe aren't in any way perfect, I know for first hand because the Transparency Task Force is actually an associate member of Better Finance, I know that organisation really, really well. Um, 
their model is far, far superior to ours. And the second organization is this one. This is the American equivalent. It's the same as the, as Better Finance. It was created as a state response to the conflicts of interest, the revolving door issues, the regulatory capture, the overpowerful lobbyists, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, that all contributed to the global financial crisis. And the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, it, it, imagine the FCA if the FCA's only job was to protect consumers. That's basically what the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau is. And Ken earlier spoke about Fair Canada, which is remarkably similar. It's a similar thing. The Canadians had to basically build their way to, to achieving this. And in some way, the trajectory TTF is on is in a similar trajectory to Fair Canada. In other words, it wasn't created off the back of the disasters of the global financial crisis. The you know people like Ken and others made it happen through blood, sweat, and tears, and that's kind of the journey that we're on. I genuinely think, and I've said this at a meeting I was in in London yesterday. I genuinely think the UK setup is so rotten to the core that we are in need of our equivalent of the Royal Commission in Australia. And if the Royal Commission for the UK results in something like a better finance or a consumer financial protection bureau or a fair Canada, then that will be light years ahead of where we are. Because at the moment, right, we are basically extremely well intended street fighters, right, uh, with knives and fists and feet taking on tanks and blow torches. And I think eventually we'll win because David is always beaten by Goliath sooner or later because ultimately, ultimately, it comes down to who's in the right most. But I'll tell you what, folks, I'd much rather have this fight with a bit of a, you know, a couple of machine guns on, on, on side if you're getting through. I'm not advocating violence, folks. I hope you're understanding I'm not a violent person and just making the point that we need to tool up. We need to tool up, folks. And part of that tooling up process is doing things such as separating the advice from the product. Part of it's about getting proper, proper inquiries to look into this stuff because we're not going to do it if we carry on um, in a peaceful way. Those are my thoughts, folks. It's it's quarter to, quarter to eight. Let's run through to eight o'clock if people want to. Um, uh, I'm, I'm happy to continue the conversation. Would anybody like to respond to any of the conversations that we've had so far? But before we do, can I please invite everybody, if you don't mind, just to, to once again put our, feet, our hands together to thank Steve, middle, uh, thanks to Pedro O'Donnell and, and Steve Conley and everybody that's spoken tonight, Diane and everybody else as well. Uh, thank you, folks. Would anybody like to come in with any comments? Thank you. And if not, I'm happy to wrap things up. Lata, Lata you were speaking earlier. I had to interrupt you because I needed to get back on track time-wise. We've kind of yeah, done that, that now. Lata, that what, what, what were you brilliant, like to hear? Steve. I enjoyed his comment, um, uh, his, his presentation. Oh. Um, just wanted to say, though, when you say we have to fight a war, Fair enough, but what about the vulnerable people? Are they really fit state to be fighting a war? No, no, I don't think they are. <laughs> I think that would be the equivalent of putting, you know, women and children on the front line and the old and, and the, the infirm. Not at all. Not at all. Yeah, they should not be fighting this at all. It's, it's, it's so imbalanced and so yeah. cruel um, yeah. and it's criminal, really. So why you know, I like that organization where they want to teach us our rights and more fairer system yeah. and all this. And this is where I can't understand why IFAs call themselves IFAs because they're not really interested in helping yeah. us. All they're interested in is getting money every year, recurring funds for holding our money they're not actually even if we're losing they make a cut that is criminal isn't it i mean yes. i don't need anyone to hold my money and pay yes. them 
you know, yeah. to go and have a party and and to put it in a trust where it'll disappear down a hole. I mean, trusts aren't very safe either, are they? I mean, where does the money go? Who handles it? There's so many questions that are left unanswered. You know, there is no safe place for earning, uh, putting our earnings, our hard-earned money that we've sweated over. We've had sleepless nights. We've sacrificed for only to be, <laughs> you know, yeah, that's take it right. back away. That, that doesn't make sense to me. This system doesn't make sense at all. Lassa, thanks for sharing your thoughts. I mean, fine to agree with you. We're going to go to Martin White, Martin, and then we'll go to one or two others yeah. and we'll bring our conversation. I, 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 I think in, in response to Lassa, if you like, slightly trying to be slightly encouraging, which is if people knew who they could trust, it would change the world. But somehow it has to be broadcast who you can trust. And essentially, uh, the model that Steve put which is one of genuinely independent financial advisors who charge by the hour and, and don't have any other kickbacks. That is what's needed. In, in, the, in exactly the same way that if, for argument's sake, you know, you wanted your... <laughs> you wanted it... Okay, silly example. You wanted your, your, your lawn cut once a week. You know, you go and pay a governor to cut your lawn once a week. You know, simple, straightforward transaction, completely transparent. You do X, I'll pay you Y, job done, thank you very much. No hidden agenda. You know, the the, the, the guy cutting your grass hasn't got some kind of uh, alternative agenda where he can make more money out of you by doing something else. Um, so maybe one guerrilla option is to do something, to promote something that's genuinely good and talk about it. Well, I think I think that's one of the reasons why I'm keen to continue my conversation with Steve because I think it's a model that's got real fundamental advantages. I, I think so, that. and um, I think what Steve's doing is quite in line with what my organisation's trying to do, and it would be rather rather yeah. good to talk. It's good, <laughs> yeah, 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 cool. Thanks, Martin. Thanks, everybody. Um, think, uh, John wants to say something, Andy, and uh, I wouldn't mind saying something. Quickly. Of course, thank you. Forgive me, folks, if I can't see you, and my eyes are uh, all over the place. John, why didn't you come in? Thank you. I saw something somewhere. If you hit the space bar, you temporarily unmute yourself. Sorry. Okay. Uh, just by way of contextual uh, intro, quickly for those uh, listening, I worked in the Middle East for 30 years in the construction industry. Um, don't laugh too loud, but in actual fact, the next to last IFA I had was called Phoenix Consultancy Services. <laughs> I had to chuckle at that early on in the presentation. It, it could have been worse. It could have been flogging Phoenix. Couldn't it? It <laughs> well, I believe the guys. Phoenix. I believe the guys moved on yet again. But I, I, I absolutely uh, wash my hands of them completely. I'm still involved in a, a fairly massive fraud to do with car parking spaces at various airports and whatever and whatever. Uh, what is it? About four thousand five hundred people lost lost a total of two hundred thirty million. Mm. It's it's big scale stuff, and it's the same guy, and he's still walking the streets, and he's still got his racing stables and his collection of cars and his private planes and all the rest of it. He's a free man. Everybody knows who he is and where he lives. But there we are. Um, just to ask a couple of questions. I'm in a very very similar situation to Diane. Uh, my wife is French. You might even hear the French TV going in the background in this room. Um, uh, I check my my present um, IFA. During the conversation this evening, I've heard that IFAs are or aren't necessary, should certainly shouldn't be necessary. But my understanding of I, the role of the IFAs, IFAs in all of this is you have to have an IFA to be able to deal with the pension providers. They won't talk to you on your own. You cannot go to... XYZ life insurance or pension company or whatever and take out a plan directly at least that's been my understanding uh, maybe that suits the IFA to spin that line of course I don't know but uh, anyway I'm in France and I'm about to, uh, to just sign the piece of paper this tomorrow probably I've promised it for 
on a similar pension plan to what Diane has. Yeah, it's never made any money because not only have we got the provider, we've got the middleman, the IFA, we've got some platform churning out numbers every month. That, uh, and so it goes on. They're all they're all on the gravy train, and uh, I'm, I, uh, I I despair really. The thing just I, what was the word I used? It's um, oh, I've forgotten. Anyway, it waddles around and just goes nowhere, the whole thing. I've had enough of it. I'm coming up to the age at 73 where there's a limit on how long you can hold this thing uh, before you can cash it up, 75 apparently. So if you don't do it by 75, they keep all the money and uh, you're on a, you know, a constant drip, as it were. Just a couple of questions um, to our presenter, <clears throat> um, Peter. Yeah, but Peter's had, had to jump off. But he, well, anyway, get. I just wondered whether in his wide, obviously, experience now, this is solely a UK problem, primarily? No, no, no. This is a general issue of well, it's, bad it's, advice is, 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 is definitely international. Um, okay, okay. Yeah, but, yeah. but the scale of it and the level of the corruption of it I think the is UK that... Yeah, I think the UK is like a really bad example of it. It's it's definitely. I mean, are there? Are, you know, I get the feeling I know nothing about French pensions or anything. But when I when I relatively recently heard that uh, your average working Joe in France or Gaston uh, gets a pension of three quarters of his final salary, that is that is the game for these guys. Yeah. Christ, there's no point in going overseas. They Gee, have a isn't no wonder they're happy. They have a taxpayer affordability problem, I'm afraid. Well, there is, but um, as long as it doesn't uh, manifest itself too strongly before they drop dead, it's not their problem, is it? Very, very true. Thanks, John. Thank you very anyway. much. Anyway, we're going to go to Steve, and then I'm going to say thank you to all of our speakers, including, of course, Peter's, because Peter's session was absolutely rock solid. It really was, and we have to thank Peter for the inspiration yeah. for tonight's session. Steve, your comments, please, before I bring up. Yeah, Peter's one, one right. comment is about uh, uh, Christopher Willard. He was the former. Uh, CEO of the FCA. Yeah. Uh, he, he in the lead up to what's now consumer duty. He said basically the that low cost, well, well diversified investment funds are generally available for the public. It's just nobody takes them up, and that's why they needed the consumer duty regulation. Basically, the uh, di direct consumer uh, market is commoditized, and uh, it's as easy as running. Uh, if you do boring stuff. You know, if you don't try to beat beat the market, you want to do straightforward, boring, vanilla stuff. Then most people, ninety percent of people, can do that themselves. Really, relatively easy with just a bit of education. So that's uh, just did. So it can be done. But there is a rule in the UK about you can't do a DB pension transfer without seeing an FC, FCA product flogger. So I don't don't quite see how you have to see a product salesman in order to get your you know, talk about your options on your defined benefit pension. Anyway, that that was uh, that was the, the one of the points. The other point I want to make, Andy, was about um, Australia and the Royal Commission, because what that what blew that up is uh, they called the FIFA No Service scandal, yeah. which basically um, the financial advisors and firms were taking fees without delivering any service to consumers. And uh, that resulted in about a five billion pound, uh, five billion dollars, Australian dollars compensation being paid uh, back to investors. And uh, I think AMP directors were threatened with criminal prosecution. I don't know whether that's still happening. But basically, uh, it's breaking in the UK now. About two weeks ago, in the Daily Telegraph, there was an article on St James's Place about their being taking fees for offering no service. And my estimate is that their compensation alone could amount to about five billion pounds if they had to do what Australia did, which is why I think we've got consumer duty, which doesn't have any backdating, which is why we haven't got private right of action in the UK against regulated companies, because uh, basically it costs St. James's Place uh, with those retrospective uh, private rights of action for consumers, it would cost St. James's Place all the shareholders of St. James's Place, more to the point, $5 billion, 5 billion pounds in compensation. 
So, but it's happening. It's starting to come out through the woodwork about fee for no service. St. James Place's share price has plummeted. They've had to cut the charges, still charging three times what they ought to be charging for what you get. But it's starting to happen. The cracks are starting to show. And we just got to really do our guerrilla stuff uh, as individuals, as campaigners, as uh, collaborating communities, and just take it at every angle and try and attack it at all, you know, pincer movement around the, <laughs> around the guys and try and get them any way we can, to, as fast as we can. So that's all I wanted to say, Andy, on that. Brilliant stuff. Thank you very, very much. And you know what? I'm just going to finish on a, a particular slide, um, a, a graphic I've just, um, I've just seen. Um, AMP, AMP, Australian Mutual Providence or Australian Mutual Providence Society, the organisation that Steve has just mentioned. I, I know it very, very well. I, I know it very, very well because it was once an organisation I really loved. And I really loved it because I worked for it. I helped to build the AMP presence on the South Coast in the UK. And this is going back a long, long time. It was a mutual operation. It had caring, paternalistic values. Um, because it was a mutual, the clients owned the company. And that culture, like many mutuals, uh, determined how it functioned. So we were taught and brought up to care for the clients. And I loved it. And the consultants were treated well and respectfully. They treated the clients well and respectfully. It was a lovely, lovely organization. It really was. I was so happy working there. Um, I loved it. AMP then made this horrific mistake of buying car insurance. And it then in the UK morphed into the financial advisor division of Pearl. And there was a complete culture clash. And bit by bit, it started to go downhill. And then AMP demutualized. And this is the key point. AMP demutualized. They went from being a caring, paternalistic, we exist for the benefit of our clients. Our clients are our members. Our clients are our shareholders. It went from that kind of culture to what matters is making money and share price and how can we drive up the share price and what do the analysts want to get us to do so we can drive up the share price and how can we link our bonuses to the effing share price, which is my language, folks. And it then started to develop a, a, a predatory sales mindset Exactly like the banks in the UK over the period of about 25 years, the banks went from being banks to financial sales operations. Steve Connie knows all about this, all about this. And, and let me share with you a, a particular picture. Um, and, and the point I'm making is, I am absolutely convinced that there is no need for there to be a playoff between good customer service, treating people respectfully, and companies making a lot of money. I'm absolutely sure of that. In other, in other words, in other words, um, if you treat your customers badly, sooner or later, you as a company will pay a price. It may take years for that to happen. And to try to make this point, look at this, folks. I just Googled it just a minute ago. It's, it's, it's the share price of AMP, right? It's a share price of AMP, and as you can see, it's basically collapsed. Um, it's, it's collapsed. And who knows? Who knows? Maybe St. James's Place is going to follow that trajectory. Maybe it will, maybe it won't. Um, but that's so sad. It's so sad. Well, so, I, I had shares of AMP, and I've just not been following it, and I've just remembered by looking in my portfolio I need to remove them but, or do something with them. Yeah. But that's the thing. When you buy shares, you forget about them, don't you, because you get so absorbed with other things, activities, and these things creep up on you. And this is where I'm saying they don't keep us informed. Yeah, you're right, Lata. You're right, Lata. Thank you so much. We're, we're going to be bringing our conversation to a close. Allow me, if I may, to briefly recap. 
Peter O'Donnell put his 12-ish years experience into a presentation that lasted, I don't know, 45 minutes or so. And I think it's impossible to have heard Peter speak without coming to the conclusion that our entire system is rotten. Plain English, that's how it is. Seriously sad, seriously sad. We had Diane talking about her experiences and how it's actually even worse when you start to take into account a multiplicity of jurisdictions. It becomes infinitely worse and it's already really, really bad. We had Ken Gavenko talking about Fair Canada and how that's helping to protect consumers in Canada. Um, Steve Conley talked about the way that he works, uh, perhaps a way that strips out the inherent conflict between advice and sales. And I talked to you folks about the long-term vision that I've got of TTF or something similar, evolving into something like Better Finance or the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau or Fair Canada. In other words, properly resourced, uh, where it's much less like a David versus Goliath struggle and we're actually part of the system we're trying to change, as opposed to outsiders trying to change the system. Tonight's session has turned out to be far, far more thought-provoking than I could possibly, possibly have hoped. I'm so glad that Peter O'Donnell kindly um, instigated this meeting that we've had today. Can I please invite you all to put your hands together and once again, thank Peter, thank Steve, thank Diane, thank everybody that participated. It really has been a remarkably uh, thought-provoking conversation. And quite frankly, it's um, accelerated my thoughts about where I want to be putting my energies for TTF. We need to start building better finance, uh, Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, Fair Canada, brick by brick. That's brilliant news because it gives us real clarity about where we want to go. And as always, in every journey, if you know where you're trying to go, it really helps make a difference. Thank you all very much indeed. Good night and bless yourselves. Thank you. Take care, folks.